liquidate number 168 is an Ingvi inspired pick and run as usual i'm gonna play it one slowly and then break it down during the breakdown i'm gonna share some practice advice you can apply to this thing and pretty much anything else you're practicing if you want the tabs you have a link down in the description below we're gonna start here on the seventh fret of the a string <laughs> Right, so this is just built on the uh, Aeolian scale, A Aeolian, just on regular old A minor scale. And uh, we'll start here with a sweep arpeggio. And before we get started actually, uh, there's also a link down in the description to the backing track. And the backing track is by Tim. Uh, backing track by Tim, that's his, that's his channel. So if you want to try it out over the backing track, you can just try that for free. All right, so we start here with this A minor arpeggio, five string. So we have seven, 12, 10, nine, 10, eight, 12. And I pick it like this, down, hammer, down, 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 up, and then pull off, go back to the B string, up stroke, and then from the G string, we go down, down, down. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Shift up to the 17th fret and go down this 5 string arpeggio uh, 17, 12, 13, 14, 14, 15, 12. After that, I have this picking run, and if you look at the notation, it's kind of looks a bit weird. It's uh, 13 over 16th notes uh, times 2. Uh, just look at the tab and you know what I mean. But what this whole thing is, is that I'm not playing six tuplets. I'm playing somewhere, in, and I'm not even playing septuplets. I'm actually fitting 26 notes into the bar. And they're not exactly even, but that's the way that I decided to notate it. And this way of playing is something you hear in English playing a lot, and you hear it a lot in uh, Key Marcellus playing as well. And I really like this type of feel you get. It's a bit tricky sometimes and you know you screw it up sometimes but the, the the idea is that you you cram as many notes as you need in there for for the phrase and then you end up at a logical point somewhere uh, and in this case it's going to be uh, the downbeat of the next bar so it really is about uh, you know the way that it sounds and the way that it feels so it can be tricky at first but i think it sounds uh, generally more musical than when you always play everything exactly on the grid. It can sound kind of almost like your the notes are put in a straight jacket sometimes. In some styles it works really great playing like that, but I think uh, why Yngwie, in my opinion, sounds so musical when it was in the sort of best period is because it wasn't that strict, you know, on the beat everything. So it sounds more fluid in that way. Anyway, uh, that's what I did. So if you look at that and be like, huh, what's that? Uh, <laughs> it's just a way to notate it. Uh, so what I'm actually playing here, I'm just starting this note, uh, 10th fret. I'm just going up uh, 10, 12, 14 on A, D and G. Uh, and then we have 12, 13, 15 on B and E. So. And from this note, we're gonna do that Ingve pattern. So that's gonna be this group of four where we number the notes from left to right, one, two, three, the actual sequence goes three, one, two, three. Shift up to the next set of three notes, three, one, two, three, shift up to the next set, three, one, two, three, and then you bend from this note a half step. So Uh, and then I hold this bend for a while and then let it go to the root and then I do this so this shift I guess you could do that as well the index finger and then I I slide up to 20 
and then uh, bend it up to 22, which is the root note. Then let it go a half step down. And that's technically out of the scale, but pretty much anytime you have something a uh, half step below a chord tone, it's gonna work out all right. So that's why you get this kind of... Why that kind of stuff works, which basically I have this, if you have this minor triad and you add a half step below each uh, note of the triad. It's gonna sound good. Uh, you can do that in major as well. So you would hear that a lot in uh, Mozart's music, but also the major stuff especially, you would hear that a lot in Chopin. Uh, but I'm sort of digressing here. Uh, but anyway, that's why this works. So as long as you don't hang on that note, you're gonna be fine. All right, so that's pretty much it. Uh, in terms of practicing this one, I would just take each sequence and I think uh, the first half, or the, um, the first two beats of the first bar, that's a, a good repeating exercise actually. So you just go, and then maybe go back down again. So obviously not to that tempo, just move it up and down in half steps at a very, you know, uh, solid tempo where everything feels really good. So... It's no point practicing faster than you can do it uh, correctly. Uh, for the picking run, I would divide it up in uh, two separate parts. You have the ascending scale and once you hit this note, you can go... Just work on that separately. Uh, but again, if you have real issues with any of these techniques, you kind of need to spend time on, the, on them outside of this thing. So that's a general thing. Whenever you come across something in a song you're learning or a lick or whatever, and you feel like, oh shit, I'm quite far off from being able to play this. Uh, don't just sit there and play that lick over and over and over and over again, hoping that you will get there. Uh, maybe you will get there if you do it long enough, but I think it's a way more efficient way of getting there and that would be to work on your overall technique, right? Meaning that if it's a picking thing, look into picking routines and, and things like that and, you know, lo and behold, I have the guitar gym if you want some inspiration, but, but regardless, whatever you do, uh, try to, to work on the, the whole thing, meaning the whole area of problems instead of just sitting there trying to learn one lick. Because usually what happens is that you want it to sound like the artist you're trying to imitate, and then you're gonna practice faster than you can actually do it, and you're gonna ingrain a lot of mistakes. Whereas if you do a lot of exercises like scales and technique exercise and whatnot, and keep that up, you're gonna find that those licks you're trying to learn, they will get better even without extra practice. So that's what I've found out for myself. And that's also why, what I teach all my students. Still takes a shit out of time though. So don't be discouraged. Uh, it, it will take time to, to get this to work. Uh, so don't let anyone try to sell you on like, well, buy my course and within five weeks, you're gonna be Paul Gilbert. Because again, I've said this before, Paul Gilbert was, wasn't Paul Gilbert that quickly either. It takes time to do this. And that's why it's so cool when you get it, because then you know it's something that's really valuable and not just something that, you know, anyone can get if they have the money to, you know, get the right coach or whatever. It's, it doesn't matter. You have to put in the work yourself and it will take the time that it takes. But if you practice correctly, uh, and there's more than one way that is correct, but in general, focusing on accuracy above speed, and putting in the time and remaining patient, even when you s doesn't feel like you make any progress at all, I think you will surprise yourself uh, within a few months. Uh, doesn't mean that you're gonna be at your hero's levels within a few months, but you will definitely see a huge improvement if you keep it up. So with that said, I uh, feel like Tony Robbins here, but uh, <laughs> give this a try. If you have any questions, just post them below. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this one and see you in the next one.